Hi, this is Tim with James Jacob Prash via Skype of, of Morial Ministries and Morial TV and Morial Radio. Uh, Jacob, one of the believers had the question based on Ezra 10, verses 3 and 4, and verses 10 and 12. How could Ezra demand that Israelites divorce their foreign wives and send them away along with the children born to them? The problem is in the translation, we understand foreign as ethnic, as racial, as national, when in fact, in scriptural thought, it meant pagan, not worshiping the one true God. Had any of these Gentile women done as Ruth had done and converted, abandoning their idolatry and putting their faith in the one true God and coming under the covenant of Moses, they would not have been considered foreigners. They would have been foreigners who joined themselves to the Lord, as it says in Isaiah. Those marriages would have been as valid as marrying a Hebrew woman, and the children would have been the offspring of a Hebrew marital union. The issue was not ethnicity, nationality, race. The issue was belief. In the New Testament, it has this equivalent, avoid marriage with non-believers. Now, the situation was this. What was called divorce here, Garush or Ligaresh or Ligaresh, Garusha, would, I suppose, in modern terms, be legally or juridically translated annulled. The marriages, according to Torah, were never valid to begin with. The marriages were never valid in God's eyes to begin with. Much the same as if someone divorces a Christian wife or husband with no scriptural reason and marries another. That second marriage is not valid in God's eyes. It's an adulterous relationship, but God does not look upon it as a valid marriage. Well, its Old Testament equivalent was that. Had these pagan women converted and believed in the one true God, and brought their children up in that belief, according to Torah, it would not have been an issue or a problem. It was the ones who refused to do so. It was not a test of anything other than the strength of their belief. Were they willing to abandon their pagan religion and idolatry and gods and worship the one true God? If the answer was no, then they loved their pagan gods more than the real one, and they loved their pagan gods more than their husbands, as it were, and, albeit invalid husbands. They were to go. It was a call back to the Torah. Its New Testament equivalent would be somebody who is divorced and remarried with no biblical grounds. And there are Christians who are doing this, and preachers who are doing this, even major figures. They need to leave the unvalid, invalid marriage and attempt to be reconciled to their first spouse, if that is possible. If it's not possible, remain single. The grounds were very narrow <coughs> in the New Testament for divorce and remarriage. Now, again, we're talking about a believer. We're not talking about what someone may have done before they were saved and they got saved. That is a different circumstance. But we see in the Old Testament the importance of holy matrimony in God's eyes, that it was just as important in his eyes and in his sight under the law of Moses as it is in the New Covenant. Just as important, in fact, in the New Covenant, it's even more so because Moses permitted things concerning divorce that Jesus did not. Thus it is. Um, it was not about ethnicity or nationality. It was about worship of the one true God. If they would not come to worship the God of Israel, they loved their demon idol gods more than they loved the true one and more than they loved their Hebrew husbands. Now, <laughs> God knew if this was tolerated, it would introduce pagan idolatry, demonic religion, and all of the acronyms that followed it into the nation of Israel and contaminate them 
spiritually. It would spiritually and morally contaminate Israel. That is why God demand, demanded an end to it. He would not have people who worship demon idols, worship other gods, intermarrying with his people, bringing those religious and cultural influences into the house of Israel that could only contaminate the children of Israel for future generations. Likewise, you'd have the intermingling of pagan children with children of those who believed in the true God. God could not allow that. Thank you for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Thank you, Jacob. Dear friends, greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. In this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church. Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Glum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.